Well, it's the end of the month, and that means it is the end of our Jellyfin Challenge. We all tried it. Um, I don't know if we're any worse for the wear or not. We'll find out as the episode goes on. But Alex, I see a smile on your face, so it couldn't have gone that bad. It's still running. It's defied all expectations. <laughs> hey, we're giving the good stuff away in the first 30 seconds of the episode here. What's going on? <laughs> if we were proper podcasters, we'd say some boring stuff for the first 15, 20 minutes and then say, don't forget to watch to the end. Like, comment and subscribe. Oh, yeah. Do you guys want to have some friendly banter? We could have a line in the dock that says friendly banter. We could do that for a little bit and tease it out. No, we wanted to get right to it this week because it's a big topic and uh, to help us fill out the roundtable is, of course, our buddy Brent is back. Hello, Brentley. Well, hello. Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you for joining us on this Jellyfin Challenge. And then I think for the first time ever on the show, Alex's wife, Kat's here. Hello, Catherine. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Hi. And thanks for also being willing to uh, give us the uh, spousal approval factor, the legit, genuine spousal approval factor right here on the show. The real review. The real deal. So <laughs> <Yeah>. appreciate it. <laughs> I just thought it was super important to get the uh, the wife's perspective, given that she is uh, at least fifty percent of the user base of the of the TV in this house. <laughs> for now, for now, until until that kid of yours gets older, and then Ella's coming. Yeah, she's coming. You're gonna have a whole new set of libraries just for the kid. It's starting. We've got Bluey already, like on tap. <laughs> 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 well, you know, we've talked on and off about. The switch to Jellyfin. Um, just to recap, if you're joining us now, the guy, the idea was to see if we could make it a whole month switching from Plex, and we're all really big Plex enthusiasts, so it seemed like a it seemed like something worth trying because we like the ideas of our media server not requiring any connection to the internet or login, not really necessarily having a strategy tact where they have to look like a streaming company, and of course, we like it to be open source if it's got something we're going to self-host and run for a long time. Jellyfin checked all those boxes, but we knew it would have some. Some issues compared to Plex, uh, intro skipping is only available via plugin, and the support is spotty at best. And of course, remote streaming and library sharing are definitely more challenging and more manual with Jellyfin. But there's also been a lot of upsides. Since we started this challenge, uh, Swiftfin came out, which is their native Apple TV client, which I was able to try. And Alex, I feel like since we started the Jellyfin challenge as well, You've kind of had a philosophy change in terms of inbound traffic to the LAN and kind of how you're going to do it with Jellyfin going forward. So it's, it seems like it's it's kind of made you rethink a few things. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, port 32400 was pretty much the last one that was open in my firewall for Plex. <laughs> I just don't want anything open at all. And we've we've gone back and forth on the Discord with several people as well as people on Twitter and stuff like that trying to figure out a decent way to do remote access for jellyfin and there are lots of different ways you could skin that particular turkey if you wanted to but none of them really did it for me because at the end of the day i don't want a publicly routable dns entry of any description whether it's on a vps tail scale tunneled or wire guard tunneled from that vps into my lan or there's some kind of outbound punch with like i say tail scale to somewhere else Without that kind of third-party cloud authentication server that Plex has, uh, there is no real way to do it with Jellyfin. The only solution I could really come up with is it's got to be baked into Jellyfin itself. There's got to be some way for me to host a Jellyfin endpoint on a VPS that speaks a Jellyfin-specific protocol or some kind of connection language back to the server in my LAN that then I can point clients from a remote LAN to on that VPS. It's not, a, you know, it's not an advertised publicly routable DNS. Maybe it's some, I don't know the technicalities of how that would work. You know, I, you know how you could do it, Alex, is sort of the Nebuchadnezzar model with Home Assistant. Yeah. Security through obscurity with a massively long URL. Yeah. And basically it's a upsell that supports the development of Jellyfin, but they also take care of that proxying for you. That would be huge. And then, you know, it, the client, the reason it's important to bake it into the client and the server is so that you can do some kind of peer to peer connection once you actually start the stream. Because if you're trying to stream it all through, let's say, a Linode VPS, for example, you'd very quickly hit your one terabyte cap if you're not careful. And, you know, then it, it's just not necessary to stream it through a remote endpoint like that. I think it kind of depends on 
on what your objective is. Because I think with this whole thing, too, I've been like, all right, <laughs> no more inbound. But I have to be real and I have to think, well, what am I going to do when I'm traveling again? Because a big part of traveling for me is like if I'm gone for several days, what I've done in the past is I've watched a show in the hotel. Like I'll, bring, I'll put the wife on a video call and we'll watch a show or something like that. And I'm trying to think how I'm going to do that in my post jellyfin world. Well, it's fine for you, isn't it? Because you you can pretty much connect all of your clients to Tailscale. Yeah. And then you can route, route the DNS through your reverse proxy and it's it's all fine. Except for like hotel TVs and stuff. But yeah, you're right. For a lot of my personal devices. It's for family members. It's for hotel TVs. It's for Roku's, Chromecasts, that kind of client that uh, Jellyfin just isn't going to work for me remotely. Right. But I've been delighted with it in the LAN on uh, my Android TVs, my pair of shields that I have in the house. Performance has been fantastic. The library just loads really quickly. Playback's been pretty much flawless. How have you found it, Catherine? Um, yeah, as a user, I haven't really noticed much difference in usability from Plex. I mean, it looks slightly different, but it's been pretty intuitive to just be like, oh, okay, it looks slightly different. Okay, well, cat, I'll go in cat. Oh, movies, yeah, okay. And it loads and it's just done. I was like, oh, okay, I can live with this. I don't have to fiddle around with anything and I can't skip the credits though. That is a little irritating. The intro skipping. Yeah, yeah that that's what I mean. Mm-hmm. Kat, have you tried fast forwarding? Because there, it is really good at going through and finding the chapters. I think you might have to turn it on in the Jellyfin dashboard. I don't recall. But if you do that, it'll mark the intro as one of the chapters. And then if you just skip that chapter, it's essentially like intro skipping. Mm, I haven't tried that, but. If your playback tries it. Yeah, okay. I think the client has to support that too. So I'm not positive. There's a couple of things with the Android TV client that have been uh, bugbears of mine, and they are very, very minor things compared to the client of a year ago. This 0.15 update is fantastic. So when I want to skip through, I have to press the left or right buttons, as you would expect, to jump 30 seconds forward and 10 seconds back. That works fine. But when you press the the right arrow to jump forward, you then also have to press enter, like the OK button, for it to actually start playing. Anyway, it's a tiny little thing, but it's annoying. The second thing is I have an OLED TV and I rely on the screensaver and a timeout on the shield of, I think it's 10 or 12 minutes or something to turn the screen off. And there's been a couple of times where we've paused the video and it's just stayed paused on that. It hasn't even dimmed the screen. And there was one time we left it on for like three or four hours before we came back in the room. And I'm like, oh, crap, because, you know, it's the three year old TV. And so far, there's no burn in at all. I'd like to keep it that way if I can. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a question for you, Brentley. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, uh, I know you went ahead and did a full setup, and I know you've also been doing some watch along with Wes. And I'm just curious to know what some of your impressions were with that process, how reliable it's been, if you've had any challenges with the setup or running a local instance, et cetera. Hmm. Yeah, where to start? Well, Wes and I did watch uh, one of your favorite recent shows. Uh, together. You've been trying to get us to watch that for a year. You know, we chose not to do the watch along. And the reason for that is that we wanted to test both of our instances concurrently and be able to discuss the experience. So, uh, so what we ended up doing was he shared some media with me. So we had the identical files and then I played it locally and he played it on his setup. I think his setup's on a VPS. So we on purpose didn't try the like um, play syncing feature. I know we tried that, Chris. I think it was a, like almost a year ago, and it was actually really really good. So I we had some good confidence that it would just be fine and continue to be fine. But it was fascinating to play the same media concurrently on two different setups because for me locally, I had a few like initial difficulties with media naming and and such with some of my own files. Luckily, Wes solved that all for me with his files. But it was curious because when we we kind of did it like old school, okay, three, two, one, play. So it's not perfect. But we knew that going in, right? That wasn't the point. The point was to see what our experience was going to be concurrently. And it was fascinating. So for me, it played with subtitles on by default. And I was able to just turn those off. 
But for Wes, he was like, oh, I want subtitles. And it, despite having all the same files from the identical folders and everything, it wasn't working for him. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> like, that's such a fascinating thing. And, and I think he ended up just kind of like refreshing the interface and then it worked, you know? So those like little tiny things were interesting to observe in real time with someone else and their setup. I'd love for you to repeat that test with Plex and or oh. any other system. Because I think all of the quirks, you know, we 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 are splitting hairs here. We are picking out needles in a haystack, and a lot of these quirks exist just with media playback in general, it's not jellyfin specific stuff. But uh, that's a great point. Yeah, I agree. It worked. You did get it done. Um, and for you, I would imagine, Brent, since you're not heavily invested in Plex, this is probably a no brainer just to stick with jellyfin, right? It really is. Yeah, I. I I've used Plex lots from a streaming media from each of your servers. So that was certainly something I missed this month. I felt like I was, you know, a bit lesser this month for that reason. And I will admit, I did cheat one evening. Drew happened to leave his server on and I was out of town in a pretty crummy hotel and I needed to pick me up. And so my brother and I watched Rick and Marty. <laughs> oh, geez. So, so that was one that was one night and I admitted it instantly. So I feel like I need to put that out there. Yeah, that's true. You did a fess up. We all knew about it. That's a fair point. I'm glad it sounds like you intend to stay with it. For me, it wasn't a foregone conclusion necessarily. One thing that I think maybe Plex does a little bit smoother is handle media that it doesn't know anything about, especially in SwiftFin. The SwiftFin client, unfortunately, keeps showcasing YouTube videos that I downloaded that it doesn't really know what to do with. And so I just have these ugly, blank, really weird looking file named videos that are just like the banners in, in Swiftin. It's kind of gross. So I set out on a kind of a journey to see if I could fix that. And I discovered that there's a couple of different ways to do this. Number one is there is a plugin for Jellyfin that will go out and get the metadata for a YouTube video. So if you leave the YouTube ID in brackets, like YouTube DLP might do by default, if you leave that in the file name, then the YouTube metadata plugin that I'll have linked in the show notes will just go out and fill out all the NFO information, all of that, that Jellyfin can read and just make it display like it would a regular series video, which is really nice. There's some powerful stuff with YouTube and Jellyfin integration. I actually found, though, most of it was overkill. I don't really want to subscribe to a channel and import it all the time and that sort of stuff. I want to get one-off how-to videos, and I want to put them in there and, and not lose them in case the author ever wants to take them down or they get pulled or whatever. So I found YTDL-sub, and that'll automate the downloading process if you want to go just all in. And just get crazy with it. And that'll that'll really take Jellyfin and YouTube to a full level integration where your YouTube videos from channels and playlists get downloaded to your server with all their metadata information. You can play them offline in Jellyfin and it's beautiful. But if that's not for you and you just want the occasional video like I do, YouTube DLP, YT DLP, will write the all of the JSON info that Jellyfin can read. There's just a real simple dash dash write dash info dash JSON that you can tack on to the YTDLP command and you can do dash dash write dash thumbnail and Jellyfin will just pick all of that up and import it automatically. So you, you get the thumbnails of person holding item, I don't know, pill, pill bottle. Yeah, with the silly face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yes, actually, yes, it's a lot of that, Alex. But the, the nice part is you also get, you get like the description you get like, you know, the other information about the video. But yeah, you're right. It is also the obnoxious thumbnail generally. <laughs> Jellyfin really started making a, a bigger impression when I spent a bit more time actually going into the plugins. I put on Twitter uh, and Mastodon one day that I spent uh, an afternoon spelunking into the plugin ecosystem. And there's an awful lot of stuff you can do with regards to metadata uh, and tweaking that on a per library, you know, specific settings per library basis. And that really improved the experience for me for things like um, album art, uh, particularly for music, was a big improvement after that. There were several covers missing uh, in my standard folder structure. I use sonar and radar to organize all of my uh, TV shows and movies, not just you know downloads and stuff like that, but stuff I ripped years ago. And it's fantastic at that because you can put things like 
custom naming conventions in there. So you can have, you know, quality, bitrate, audio, codecs, et cetera, et cetera, right there in the file name. That's great. Yeah. And uh, so, you, you know, you, you can use those programs for nefarious purposes, but they're also incredibly useful for just basic media organization there are plenty of others as well yet another media manager is a good one filebot is a good one too if all you need to do is take a bunch of files and and apply some rules like you know one one file per folder based on the file name type stuff filebot's really good for that but uh metadata seems to trip a lot of people up on the internet it's curious to hear both of you as well have little quirks but you know i've run all my stuff through the r's for years and never had a problem Yeah, actually, to that end, just as a quick aside, I don't think Jellyfin has misidentified a single television show or movie. So that has been exceptional. It's just like the rando YouTube videos because there's no like movie DB or TV DB you can go query. So it struggles with that. Yeah, it's true. I have I have a question about metadata for Brent, and then I want to hear about audiobooks. I think we got to talk about that. But Brent, I know you also had a note on metadata. Yeah, it was the thing I struggled with when this month challenge started because I thought, oh, I'm going to go and, you know, it actually started with a YouTube channel of a British show. (laughs) You two might appreciate this. I discovered a show that I, turns out I love called Taskmaster and and they host all of it on YouTube. But my internet connection here has been, let's just say, changing this month. So I thought, well, I'm going to grab them all so that I can try them on this Jellyfin instance. And they are part of the you know, TV DBs and such. Uh, but I really struggled with trying to get all of that organized in a really nice way. I um, took a bunch of advice from online and found Filebot, but it turns out that their like, licensing has changed recently and I didn't quite feel comfortable with... Oh, has it? What's, what's changed? Because it used to just be, I don't know, five, 10 bucks for an annual license. I guess maybe I just wasn't willing to pay for something that I didn't know anything about. And I didn't ask either of you whether it was good or not. So this was like my first initial jump in. So I feel like the $10 would be probably worth it from the reputation I heard, but I just didn't give that a go. Maybe that was a mistake. So because of that, I looked for other solutions and I spent far too much time trying to find something and struggled with a few of them and really didn't get anywhere useful. So I now have a bunch of Taskmaster episodes with German titles and such. And it was just a bit of a failed experiment. But Chris, this plugin sounds just right up my alley. <laughs> I'm Taskmaster. <laughs> you just say any word aggressively and that, you know, that's, that's the German. <laughs> Apart from butterfly, do you know what the German for butterfly is? No, please tell us. Schmetterling. It's such a beautiful word, Schmetterling. S- says a German descendant. <laughs> I don't speak German though, perhaps I should. Tailscale.com slash self-hosted. Go there to get it for free for up to 20 devices. Not a trial, not a limited time thing for up to 20 devices at Tailscale.com slash self-hosted. Tailscale is a straightforward mesh VPN protected by WireGuard. You're going to get it on your devices in just minutes, and then they all connect directly to each other, and it's a beautiful, secure thing. I love that it's all built on top of WireGuard. You know that noise protocol encryption is absolutely top-notch. And even if your devices are separated by firewalls and complicated carrier nets and subnets, Tailscale can navigate all of that. And Tailscale is clever enough to know what traffic to send to your Tailscale nodes versus what you just want to go out to, like, the general internet or some other subnet. And, of course, it also is clever enough to just talk directly to the machine. So if it's on your LAN and you use the Tailscale IP, it still goes over your LAN. It doesn't, like, route out to the internet first or something. It's clever like that. And it always feels like everything's local regardless of where you're at. So I have a DNS server using Pi-hole in my tailnet, and now all my devices can just use name resolution. It just doesn't matter where I'm at. Anywhere I'm at, I can use Tailscale, and I can use DNS resolution, and it's glorious. You guys know it's the only way I do my next cloud now. I don't even have a public IP for any of that stuff. It's so, so great. I could go on and on about it. You know Alex and I love it. We use it. Our family uses it. Our friends use it. We are big advocates, and I love that we're working with us, and that you can go try it out on up to 20 devices for free for as long as you want. Because the way they've built this, the traffic goes between your machines. So they're not paying for a bunch of bandwidth, right? And then they layer on a bunch of services that make it so useful, like Tailscale Send, essentially AirDrop for all your Tailscale devices, even your Android Linux boxes. Tailscale SSH allows you to get an SSH connection between your devices using the Tailscale network. They're continually adding features too. So go check out their social feeds to get an idea of just how quick they're moving here. 
And of course, they have ACL, so you can share out machines and do controls right there through a web UI. Like I mentioned, it'll support DNS. There are lots of ways to solve that, but I just tossed a pie hole in mine. And they have uh, other, even more innovative solutions now, too. It's always getting better. It's a game changer. And I'm so happy that we can send you there and you can support the show by signing up for Tailscale. That is a win-win. So just go to tailscale.com slash self-hosted. One more time, support the show by going to tailscale.com slash self-hosted. I've been threatening to do a Tailscale deep dive for a little while on how I'm doing the split DNS between different sites and stuff like that. One of these days, I promise we will get to it. But uh, my good lady wife, Catherine, has joined us for this episode. And we wanted to talk a little bit about your experience with Plex and Jellyfin and audiobooks specifically in this segment, because you're a bit of an audiobook nerd, right? Yeah. I think audiobooks is my thing. I probably listen to double the amount of audiobooks that I watch TV or use Jellyfin or Plex or whatever. So, I mean, I can catch you any time of the day or night with your phone, with your AirPods in, or just walking around the house, and there's always an audiobook. Some people it's podcasts for you, it's audiobooks, or, you know, some people it's radio. And so me turning off Plex and separating you from your beloved prologue instance a month ago was, how was it? Tricky. Tricky. <laughs> um, so I had some backups in case I really didn't like my new situation. Uh, I had Libby, which is like a, you know, library county based thing. Yeah, in America, you can sign up for a library card and they give you access to free digital audiobooks, but you can sort of rent them from a digital library. It's like a, it's like um, Audible, but like a, a library. Bit. and Yeah, it's a bit like a library, a bit like Audible. You can, there's an app, you can use it on your phone, but you only get 14 days to listen to a title and you often have to wait and you've run out a couple of times, right, have, Libby? Yeah, because yeah. sometimes you have to wait a very long time to be given access because they only have a certain amount of... They have to pay on a per-rental basis, effectively, to the publishers. And so they, they, only can, they only buy a certain number of licenses for each title. And then when those licenses are exhausted, they have to go and either buy another batch or they have to... So it's, it's expensive for the libraries to do that. So that's why there's a limit there. But... Yeah. So sometimes you could be waiting up to four months to listen to a title. So you kind of have to have them ready in advance and plan them out a little bit. But I had that as a backup um, and I had Audible and I could spend money as a backup. You're the sort of girl that has the two credits a month yeah, Audible do. subscription, right? Yeah, I do. And I use them. Yeah, well, that's fine. Hey, girl, me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And you're used to me going into Audible and backing these things up with Inaudible, which we've talked about in the show before, and removing the DRM and never really having to worry about Audible itself, you know, going away or changing licensing on you. Those, there you go. Those books, you own them forever. You've, you've paid for them, and I think it's only fair that we own them forever. So when I switched off Prologue, um, I yeah. had to come up with an alternative solution for you, and Jellyfin doesn't really have much in the way of audiobook support, so far as I could tell. Uh, that was any good. So I threw you down the gauntlet of audio bookshelf. How did you find that? Yeah, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works fine. It doesn't lose your place or anything, but it just, it's not a particularly exciting place to be in. It just doesn't like graphically speak to me um you mean you're not a fan of that skeuomorphic fake bookshelf no look? No. no okay it's very ios 5 isn't it yeah and just going into it doesn't fill me with joy yeah Mary Kondo. that is one thing plex and prologue in particular does very well is it presents things beautifully another thing it doesn't do which some of the others have done is it doesn't give me any sort of hey do you want to listen to this kind of pokes or prods you know jellyfin if you go on the home menu goes hey the next one in your series is up do you want to do it and um yeah the audiobook you have to kind of have a plan and go in and go oh i want to listen to this today and know what the name of it is and be able to search for it and find it because i had you using book sonic for a long time and one of your favorite features as i recall was the random button yeah i love that because Alex's mum and Alex's sister and my mum also put their audiobooks into our We've collection. got a whole system going. It's pretty great. <laughs> um, so I also have access to theirs, which are stored on my... Ser on, sorry, 
our server. The server. The Let's server. go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so I love just going on random and I've found some amazing books that I never would have picked or haven't come up and, you know, been promoted by Audible or Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever. Let's be honest, you found some crap too, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and Hadia's part of this too. I forgot that as well. She's joined in the uh, aud- audiobook love over here. So I have all of hers. How's Hadia found not having access to Prologue this month? Not good. That's not been smooth, Alex. That's uh, yeah. not been a smooth aspect of it. I'm, I'm, I told her I promised that eventually I'd replace it with something. But she has a couple of Audible credits and, and a couple of books in, there's a Nut Libby, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was someone we were yeah. talking about. This yeah, time. okay. I'm not sure if it's Libby or if it's in Audible, but she's in one of those right now while I have everything down. It's not great, Alex. It's not great. Hasn't been the smoothest aspect. No. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, one thing, actually, I used Audio Bookshelf uh, as I was falling asleep with with some books this month uh, just to test it for, for myself. And when I do that, I set a 45-minute timer uh, every time. And so, you know, I have to go back half an hour, 35. I do the same thing, yeah. <laughs> every, every night, and gradually yeah. I make my way through the book. Yep, I do that. But one of the most frustrating things about Audio Bookshelf on iOS, at least, is that the Scrubble bar is right next to the little line at the bottom of the iphone that you swipe left or right to go between apps on and so if you're trying to swipe back 10 minutes you can very easily swipe back to the previous app and so on you find yourself tapping instead of swiping and sometimes it doesn't register the tap because it thinks you're tapping on the little white bar at the bottom and not the seek button and so there i think probably audio bookshelf's biggest issue right now biggest impediment is the interface Generally speaking, I feel like there's a place here just thinking about our nighttime. Every single night we listen to an audiobook. We specifically pick audiobooks that are like perfect for falling asleep to. They're interesting, but not so interesting that if you miss five minutes of it, it's not the end of the world. Cause I'll back up as well. But sometimes I don't back up enough and I miss a couple of minutes. But like it's just, it's fine because yeah. it's not like a critical book. Yeah. But man, if I thought, wouldn't it be great if I get in? And I've got an NFC tag by my by my uh, headboard. I scan that NFC tag, and it kicks off the whole last call routine, which starts shutting down the lights, turns on the noisemakers, and would just start playing the audiobook for 45 minutes and then automatically kick it back, I don't know, 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, every single time. feels like there's some automation possibility there. There are those apps that can do sleep tracking just based on listening to you breathing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sleep as Android will do some of this, but I want something like around home assistant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess there's a solution in there somewhere, but I think that touches on another point specifically about Jellyfin that uh, Catherine, you and I were talking about in the car on the way home from daycare earlier. Just the general fit and finish of Jellyfin. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it just doesn't have... It's like the edges have not just someone hasn't gone around with every single pixel and gone oh this is perfect you know how when you go on google or amazon or something it's just just so correct unless you end up on the amazon page from the early days when you're trying to get a refund oh, and yeah. they still got that yeah. <laughs> original branding <laughs> uh but it's it's like when i try and make things look pretty on the internet and no matter what i do and whatever i type in css it it looks okay, but it just isn't absolutely perfect. And as a user, I just think, oh, oh, it's just not a really happy, exciting place for me to want to go to. It doesn't make me go, oh, I want to watch this or listen to that. I just go, yeah, okay, it works. That said, though, there are some particularly nice ways in which it surfaces things like movies. Like it has a really nice oh, canvas for how it displays yeah. all the posters. Reminds me a lot of what Cody used to do in the XBMC era, it was just a, a complete canvas, maybe even media browser, if I remember the name right, uh, from years ago. It was a beautiful skin for media browser that did that as well. And I like actually seeing a lot of content at once. I'm, I'm quite good at taking in, you know, three, four different rows with, you know, wide worth of content all at once from movie posters. Um, Plex doesn't do that very well at all. And I tell you the other thing that I've really enjoyed is I loaded up Plex a couple of nights ago just to remind myself uh, before we did this episode. It was fully 15 seconds after hitting go before Plex had loaded me up my homepage on the on the Android TV client. You know, there's now a, a new Plex logo where it swipes in from the side with the yellow arrow. 
and then it fades and then it pauses and thinks about life a little bit and then goes, am I a media player? Am I a chainsaw? What am I doing here? And then eventually it loads, <laughs> it loads what I asked it to load. Uh, and then once I'm in the app too, browsing libraries and stuff like that, Jellyfin is night and day faster at browsing libraries and media and stuff like that. 100% local, I think, has to be the reason for that. Although there could be some server-side code improvements versus uh, Plex. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But generally speaking, it's that performance, it's that snappiness that has got me really excited about Jellyfin. I love the performance myself. It is really nice. Now, it's important question time. I'm not going to ask Catherine because she doesn't have a choice. <laughs> We're going to have How Plex rude. and Jellyfin here simply because we have to leave Plex on for your audiobooks and then Jellyfin for the TVs. But what about you, Brent? Are you going to stick with Jellyfin? Well, it, if you're asking me, am I going to stick with Jellyfin for remote accessing your media, which you don't have a solution for, then I think the answer is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if we're talking about here at home on my local network, I think I touched on a little earlier. Yeah, absolutely. There's a function that I've been loving. Which is, you know, I've, I live in a tiny cabin. So I set up some speakers for this challenge connected to my little laptop server that Jellyfin's sitting on. And I can walk anywhere in my place and use my phone to stream media on that computer over there through those speakers. So that's been a beautiful function that I've really enjoyed here. And I don't think Plex can do that, but, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. Well, also, you're you're a bit more of a I don't want to say a zealot, but you're you're more into the privacy side of things, and yeah, you're more of a purist, I think, than I am. And so, I just think Jellyfin fits a lot better with your overall ethos than Plex ever can. Will I don't know if you both saw the article this week. It came out literally this week saying Plex now has more streaming users than media server users. If that is an indictment of where Plex as a company is going in future, I don't know what is. I, I completely agree. And if we're going to get to the question of, am I sticking with it? This headline basically made my decision for me, unfortunately. Uh, I, I, like you, I suspect I'll keep some Plex around, but I imagine it'll be more like Plex on demand. I'll fire up a Docker container when I'm going to be traveling and, you know, I'll throw a series in there, a movie or two in there, and then I'll destroy it after the trip. So it just really, for me, is th that headline right there, that story, mm -hmm. really seals the deal. Because that's where Plex has to go. And I can't begrudge them for it. I really appreciate what a great project it has been. I really appreciate how accessible they made having your own home streaming setup. And I'm going to be grateful for the years of uh, use I got out of Plex. And I do not regret my lifetime membership at all, even though I'm going to be using Jellyfin now. But I also have to be realistic. As a company, they can't. They can't grow and become successful by being the people that enabled piracy. That just cannot be what makes them successful. And uh, I'm glad to see that their streaming strategy does seem to be working. And my hope is that they do really, they leave the local playback in at least, you know, to some degree for folks that can have a little bit of both. And for the folks that are 100% all in on local and not really interested at all in the streaming, there's going to be Jellyfin. However, that said, before we wrap up, Alex, I'm curious if you're if you're using Jellyfin with the home run, if you're going to do live TV streaming, because that's been a bit of feedback we've gotten from the audience who's trying this along with us that they say hasn't worked great with Jellyfin. I've had the opposite experience. So I'm curious if you've tried it. I did try it. Yeah. I found the whole setup process just had a few more rough edges than Plex, which is, you know, not difficult given that Plex is perhaps the absolute easiest live TV setup going. You just log in say hey oh that's my hd home run over there you click connect it asks you then for a postcode or a zip code and then uh downloads the relevant xml data with jellyfin yeah it's the epg data that's the the hard part but once you've got that figured out uh it seemed to work just fine i didn't use it a ton because there weren't any huge you know sporting events or anything like that on uh at the moment but but generally speaking my experience with jellyfin you, you all know i was pretty skeptical going into this that it would stick I'm delighted that it is sticking for TV and movies and general video playback in the house on the TVs. Like they've solved the 10 foot interface problem. They're sitting on the couch with a remote watching videos. That has been near flawless for me. 
where I still need some improvements to do full adoption is the ancillary stuff, the, you know, the peripheral stuff around that experience, like audiobooks, for example. Uh, if we could just port Prologue to support Jellyfin, that would be amazing. Some stuff around Finamp, you know, you, you look at what Plexamp's done, that's still night and day, miles and miles ahead of Finamp and all the different music players. But generally speaking, you know, I don't think I mind. I can just disable the video libraries in Plex, although that might upset Brent. I might leave. I might just leave them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or I might just give him a tail scale login. Who knows? Do I trust you, Brent? I don't know. We're, we're about to find out, I think. Remember when he like lived at your house? I know, for like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so. oh, he's he been it. on your land, Alex. He's been there. <laughs> so ultimately, I think we can call Jellyfin January a huge success. I mean, all three of us are keeping at least some level, four of us, Catherine, sorry, are keeping some level of Jellyfin in the house. And that was not my expectation a month ago. So I'm I'm really pleased about that. Yeah, I'm really glad it's at this point. It's something I think that's been kind of the elephant in the room almost since the show started. And it's really nice to see it there, especially for, I think, where we've landed. It's great, like you said, on the TV. I'm super happy with it. And I, I also agree that the performance seems really fantastic. So it's, uh, if, if you're out there, I know a lot of you have been trying it out there, and you have a different take, let us know, selfhosted.show slash contact. Linode.com slash SSH. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit, and it's a great way to support the show. If you've been thinking it's time to set up some infrastructure in the cloud, but you want it to be the right host with the right kind of controls and maybe even the host that'll snap in with whatever integration tooling you have, Linode's the one I want you to consider. They've been around for nearly 19 years and they've had to survive that entire time on the merits of their product. They've had to make a great product with great support and it's 30 to 50% cheaper than the big hyperscalers that want to lock into these complicated platforms that don't give us self-hosters the flexibility that we like to see. If you like to nuke and pave and roll your own infrastructure with your own central management tools, or if you like to click and deploy with just a few clicks, maybe a quick guide, Linode's got it down for you. Whichever one you like, whatever style you got, Linode will work for you. And if you ever get stuck, they've got great support too. So when I think about where I want to go, I think of something fast. I think about something that'll be highly available. I think about something that I can rely on, that I can put my infrastructure on, that I don't have to think about all the time. That's what I want when I go to a cloud hosting provider. And Linode checks all those boxes. And they have a bunch of great features, too, like their S3 compatible object storage. Tie that in with your backups. You can use that for the back end for NextCloud. There's a lot of things you can do. So go get that $100, play around with something, support the show, and see what Linode is capable of. I think you'll be really impressed with the performance and the selection. So go to linode.com slash SSH one more time to support the show and get that hundred bucks. Linode.com slash SSH. All right. It's hard drive giveaway time. How exciting is this? I've been waiting for this. I have to say, Alex, I wasn't able to read all of these. Some of them were just heart wrenchers. <laughs> there is a 10 terabyte hard drive here with someone's name on it. And we have a clear, clear winner. Thank you very much to everybody that voted. We had a winner with 24 votes. The next closest one had 10. So very, very clear winner in there. But uh, I thought we'd read the top three because, you know, there's some really interesting stories in there. Uh, so Brent, why don't you kick us off with third place? I've royally screwed up with irreplaceable data. I know this is a lot, but it all comes together in the end. So have some patience. I can show receipts too if anyone asks. <laughs> My wife and I got married in 2010 and were immediately moved to DC by the military. By 2012, and after the third miscarriage, we gave up on trying to have kids of our own, consoled by a conversation about how the world doesn't need more people anyways. Despite this, we still wanted to be parents, and in 2013, we were moved to Las Vegas and started foster parent classes. It can't be overstated. Foster care is hell for all involved. Often the kids come out of one garbage situation only to be dropped right into another. We also tried to adopt every kid that we had the opportunity to, which led to several instances of having a kid we weaned off drugs from their first day of life being literally torn out of our hands as a toddler and handed back to the person who put them in that situation in the first place. Despite that, for every terrible situation, there was one that made us happy to hand them off. One kid literally drove away in his uncle's Porsche after spending a week with us. That was shocking, since he entered the system after his abusive mother was arrested for trying to beat a random person on the street. His uncle didn't even know he existed, and when he found out about him, 
gave him a real rags to riches childhood turnaround. Regardless of the end state, beautiful or horrifying, while they were in our house, they were our children. We intended to adopt everyone possible and treated them as our own. There were so many memories created over those years, and I can be quite the documentarian, though I was really frugal with the storage. I was actually kind of proud that I only accrued a couple of terabytes over that time frame, and that counts all the other stuff that I generated as well. This was a necessary couple of terabytes, as we weren't allowed to upload anything publicly, and I never got straight answers about whether or not I could even use cloud storage. Though I was pretty sure I could, I wasn't about to run the risk. That meant everything went on JBOD array in my closet. I left the military in 2017, and we moved back to our home state. In the move, some things got jostled. Out of smart induced anxiety, I decided to consolidate everything down into one array of five one terabyte drives in ZFS RAID 3. Thinking I was honky dory, I tossed the old drives into my hard drive graveyard. One serial ATA controller malfunction later, I found myself desperately digging through drawers, trying to recover anything at all. Some was recoverable, some though was gone forever. Birthdays, Christmases, vacations, tearful reunions, those are all gone. Kids we never see again, kids that were our family for years have been erased completely. I still hold out hope that I can somehow recover something off of that array since it was God's file system, but I don't have a controller right now that can handle the five plus one drives I would need. To this day, I'm gun shy. Everything is in multiple locations. Encryption keys are written on notebooks in different buildings. Pictures are printed. Despite it all, none of this will bring back what was lost. All I can do is ensure the future is remembered and protected appropriately. Since I'm not made of money, keeping a backup strategy has been painful. I find myself deleting things that I wouldn't if I had more space. 10 terabytes would be enough to let me spread out and prioritize instead of squeezing everything into a few drives over and over and over. What a, what a moving story, huh? Man, if, that, if that's not the worst case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. There is that horrible feeling at the pit of your stomach when you've lost some pictures. I had an SD card once corrupt mid-shoot on me. The pictures weren't super duper important. You know, it wasn't a wedding or anything like that, But or, or children I'll never see again. But there are just, I don't know, 30 or 40 pictures on my hard drive that I, I know in my mind's eye what they should be, but they're just empty files. And it I've still got them, and it hurts. <laughs> so I can only imagine what this guy went through. As, as a photographer, I've helped countless professional photographers try to recover images off of, you know, F cf cards that have been run over by their cars or like cameras that have been thrown into pools at a wedding and like crazy situations so you might imagine i, I think i've been lucky that i was always tech savvy even when i first got into it so i don't think i've lost anything super important but the number of times i've tried to help others i don't have enough hands for it takes i think genuinely a couple of data loss incidents per person before you really mm -hmm. understand you know uh, there's probably a bunch of stuff that i had on my computers as, as a teenager even in my early 20s uh whilst you know we were figuring out computers whilst windows xp was becoming you know it wasn't just me at fault it was the entire industry we didn't really have the stability that we've had over the last five ten years of mobile devices and the cloud and everything and so backups you know in the old days were even more important arguably than they are now although they're just as important, I guess, as they ever were. So yeah, this this sub story really had me going. It was interesting to see that it resonated with several of the audience as well. So uh, that was third place, uh, Chris. Why don't you take us through second place? This yeah, all right. This is this one. This one got me. So it's funny. I have, I'm the one that reads it now. Uh, about ten years ago, I convinced my wife to stop using Google Photos and allow me to back up all our photos to a local hard drive. I was fairly new to Linux at the time, and I needed to reinstall Ubuntu to fix some problems. During the install, my one terabyte hard drive was appearing twice in the list of devices. Confused by this, but convinced it was a quirk of the Ubuntu installing, I wiped both hard drives and reinstalled. Oh no. <laughs> After the first boot, I suddenly realized that I'd left my one terabyte external drive attached and had wiped the only copy of all of my wife's photos, dating back to her very first digital camera as a teenager. 
including her year spent living and working in Thailand. Knowing what I know about storage devices, I probably could have saved the data, but at the time, I just accepted all was lost and begged for forgiveness. Man, oh man, that stinks. We, we've all been there. We've all wiped the wrong disc with a, with a fat-fingered G-disc command or something. <laughs> yes. This one hurts. I was lucky because those photographers I mentioned, this is like the typical story. Test disc and photo rescue, they're kind of a combined thing. I use that countlessly to save these situations. You know, it creates a giant folder of just JPEGs or whatever mm. you've got. But at least you've got them. You know, maybe you have to sort them or whatever. That's a great tool. And I think I was so lucky to learn from others that I literally made it a rule that I unplug all the drives I don't want to lose stuff from before I do a reinstall for this very reason. You learn that lesson the hard way for sure. You think, oh, it'd be fine. I won't screw it up. I'll, I'll, it'd be fine. Particularly, you know, in this situation with just a, what sounds like an innocent USB drive left connected. So easy done. One is none, right, Alex? One is none. May as well be. So anyway, this brings us on to our winner, and uh, this was the winner by a very clear margin with 24 votes, way more votes than anybody else. So I'll take us through this one. Hi, I'm Micah Stenson. I'm 11 years old. I enjoy biking and skiing and even have my own website called micahstenson.com. Uh, I recently built my first PC for Christmas. It's an AMD Ryzen system with a 512 gig hard drive. I installed Linux Mint, and I'm really enjoying it. When I'm older, I wish to become a programmer or a computer engineer. I've been listening to Jupiter Broadcasting podcasts to learn more about Linux, and I'd like to enter for the hard drive you mentioned. Oh, that's great. Wow. I should have had my kid write in, but that is fantastic. <laughs> well, all Dylan has to do is look in a drawer, and I'm sure he'll yeah. find a drive that Brent shucked <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> that, that top drawer in the studio is a good place. Yeah. Um, now, I'm. I have some questions, because... It wasn't mentioned what the hard drive would be used for or what they were hoping to learn from using said hard drive. So I'm curious if there will be a little bit of mentorship here and what the journey might look like. I'm hopeful we can get a little soundbite from Micah or something. Obviously, you need to get in touch with us, Micah, and let us know how you'd like us to ship the hard drive to you. Maybe your uh, parents could let us know that. Uh, Selfhosted.show slash contact. You already know how to get in touch with us, though, because you sent this in, obviously. <laughs> it would be great to hear a little bit more of the... Uh, the use case for this hard drive. We'll get it sent out to you as soon as we have the shipping information over the next few days. And uh, yeah, maybe we can record a little, uh, you know, couple of minute segment for the show and let the audience know what you're doing with this disc. I hope it's a massive Plex stash. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Micah. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to pull something from the headlines. Uh, if you are looking for work recently, or if you happen to be hiring, uh, we have set up a Jupiter Jobs Matrix chat room. And this is just a place for those looking and those giving jobs. Uh, and I figure if they're in the JB community, they're probably pretty great to begin with. And if you're listening to this podcast and he hearing me mention this, the hit rate of the quality of candidate in that chat room or the quality of job is going to be really high. So I don't expect like, you know, thousands, but I expect a few dozen in there and they're probably all going to be pretty great. So we will link to that or you can just, uh, I don't know, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash matrix and get our space, and it's listed in there. It's a matrix space. Or you can go to bit.ly slash jbjobs. You know, Chris, I got a, uh, a message from one of our listeners just yesterday saying, hey, I really want to hire a JB listener, and how do I go about doing that? I've got this cool project I'm working on. So this is a perfect example. I'll make sure to get them in there. How it came up was I got contacted by somebody who wanted to buy it, buy me, have me buy into a scheme where we would all kind of like basically make money by people buying and selling jobs on a podcast or job board. I didn't want to do that. But then somebody hit me up on Matrix and they said, well, what if we just did a chat room? And I thought, let's just go simple. We don't need to grift on this. We'll just make people have a, uh, you know, a nice little connection in there. Speaking of audience support, we're going to just do the top four boosts in this week's episode because we're going to keep it tight for time. We did get everybody's boosts. Thank you very, very much and uh, appreciate them. But Anther76 came in with our top boosts this week at 177,776. That's to say <laughs> he is super excited about you getting into Kubernetes at home. I'd love to see some, uh, I'd love to even come on air and talk about debunking the complexity. I run a Discord uh, Kubernetes at home group where we get together and talk about doing uh, Kubernetes for the needful. And also he wanted to plug, and I'll have a link in the show notes to K8's at home search. 
where you can do a search there and look for all kinds of things like ways to deploy Home, ex home Assistant, for example. And he says, the great thing about Infra as Code is we can share and compare deployment strategies. Alex or Chris, get in touch if you want to chat more. And uh, so I checked out the K8 search. Have you looked at this? This is so cool. Yeah, I think we linked this in the last episode as well. It's a beast. I am still very much in my infancy with this K3S stuff at home. Uh, the new firewall's working out great. And uh, in the interest of time, we've punted a segment today. I was going to talk about my new automated DHCP and DNS setup that I built primarily because I was fed up of entering MAC addresses into OpenSense <laughs> manually by copying and pasting for each virtual machine. Uh, so now I can automate that using Ansible and Terraform, which is uh, it's fantastic. Awesome and nerdy. And yeah, I recognize this. And man, does this make, this is, this is the kind of, that's the kind of tooling that's appealing to me too. K3s is awesome, says Gene Bean. Yeah, I agree. So you know what, Alex, you struck a note there. I wondered if we were going too far into the nerdy territory and you proved we weren't. So it's nice to get that feedback. That's good to know. Well, I do need some help. At the moment, I don't really have a good handle on storage, distributed storage. So one of my goals is to run just a handful of critical services. So things like my wiki, as I mentioned last time, I think, and some other stuff, maybe now my pie hole. I'd like to distribute that because I've switched from AdGuard home to pie hole. More details next time. It would be great to, you know, use something. So I know pie hole has gravity sync. Anyway, I digress. There is Longhorn I could use for storage. There's also Rook Ceph, which I could use for storage. You know, I'll be syncing a few megabytes, maybe a gig or two at most. I'm not syncing media files or anything like that between these nodes. And one of them will be a Raspberry Pi, uh, and the other two or three nodes will be x86 boxes. So it would be great if whatever solution you recommend to me, internet, hive brain, <laughs> uh, supports multi-arch stuff as well. But yeah, it, it's a huge, huge beast. And uh, uh, so far, I like what I've seen. And it's um, it's quite refreshing. I did a I did a, an OpenShift course at work last week. And it was just, it's nice when you know what all the commands do when you see them written down before you run them, you know, in a training course like that. And it's um, in a large, a large part because of the experimentation in the home lab. Man, that's when the home lab is really, truly serving its purpose. That's so great. Monty came in with 6,000 sats. Hey, guys, short-time United States Air Force listener here. Less than two years. I've listened to every episode of LUP, self-hosted LAN, and the extras. <laughs> I love all of them and can't wait for a Northeast meetup so I can maybe join. You've sparked my tinkering interest with the WZ Mini hack in episode 88. That was the firmware for the wise cams. It says, I'm struggling to find an Ethernet to USB adapter that will work, though. Can you guys suggest one that's worked for you? P.S. Enjoy the sats. Keep up the great work. I heard a couple of people were looking for Ethernet adapters for their Wise Cams. Now, I know that the WZ Mini Hack folks list uh, a handful of compatible USB adapters, and I linked to that in last week's show notes. I don't know if those specifically do PoE, but if you look at what the dev's using, because the dev of the firmware themselves is, is doing PoE adapter, so you could probably uh, trace it back from there. I mean, to me... That's probably like a spring project for one of our road trips. So I'll probably know around then is I'm really, really hoping that I don't accidentally update the firmware on any of my wise cameras <laughs> until I can try this. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like they're just going to auto update or something, you know, like I just, we'll see. But I'm really hoping to get a chance to try the ethernet because I think that should make the picture quality really solid, especially for such cheap cameras. I put that new firmware on my wise V3 straight after the show last week. And I've done nothing with it. It, it just <laughs> continues to work as if I did nothing at all. So I suppose that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Escott came in with a row of ducks. That's just quackers. He says, this is my first time ever communicating with any kind of media entity ever. And yeah, I'm a longtime listener. Everything's on a pie here. Apache, Jellyfin, Nextcloud, Wikimedia. The Jellyfin video processing is done on the NVIDIA Jetson Nano 2 gig. And don't tell anyone, but... My media is actually hosted on a Windows 7 machine and shared out to the Pi. Psh. But hey, this Pi is running tail scale and I can access it from anywhere. I got another 8 gig Pi running with Umbral with, well, pretty much everything that's not Bitcoin related. That's awesome. There's a saying, if it works, it ain't stupid. But sometimes <laughs> Maybe that saying stupid. gets stretched a little bit. <laughs> We're not often too critical about somebody's setup, but a Win7 file server. Is Windows 7 end of life now? I think so, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little side note, 1804, Ubuntu 1804, 
end of life at the end of April. So if you've got your server based on 1804, maybe time to upgrade or time to buy the extended maintenance program. Oh, that's good to know. How is it five years? That is... I know. These are, these are the facts of life that we help you keep track of in Linux Action News. Little plug there. And our last boost, Rail 69 came in with LeetSats. Hey, gang, love the Jellyfin January challenge, and I hope the trend will continue throughout the year. Regarding donations and supporting projects, last year, I decided on a specific amount of money that I would spend and donate each month to a project which I, A, use extensively, B, would be very sad if it disappeared, and C, doesn't have a commercial way to get funding. This year, Jellyfin takes the funds for the first month. Thanks for the amazing content. I love this so much. What a fantastic idea. Uh, as you know, we donated some of our affiliate revenues from uh, cloudfree.shop and mylocalbytes.com to Jellyfin and the Matrix Project. Uh, so it's something we're doing here too, but I love to hear audience members doing it. It's fantastic. Um, in the future, when we have per episode splits enabled for the boost, we'll do uh, things like a, a split for the image project because the image project uh, takes Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so we'll put them in as a split and your boost will go towards those projects. That's coming in the new year. But I agree. I think it's, I like the overall idea of whatever way they want to take the funds, you pick a couple of projects throughout the year that you can contribute to. And I think Jellyfin is a really good contender. I think a lot of these that help you bring something on premises that's totally sovereign, they're just never going to be a huge customer base. I mean, I'd like to say it's growing, but the pool of people that are going to support them is much, much smaller than, say, something like Plex or uh, something commercial. I think you hit the nail on the head early with Jellyfin and their remote access kind of home assistant model. Uh, they just need to copy that, and then they've got funding for days, you know? I hope maybe they will. Um, thank you, everybody who boosted and even those that didn't make it on the show. We do absolutely love them and read them, but we're trying to keep it tight this week. You can boost in with a new podcast app at newpodcastapps.com or from the podcast index. Go search for self-hosted over there. And of course, a huge thank you to our members, our site reliability engineers that keep the show going and let us say no, no to those job board, crazy, creepy emails. And instead, just set up a chat room. We appreciate it. You can support the show directly at selfhosted.show slash SRE or all the shows at jupiter.party. You get the show ad free. And you get the post show here on the self hosted show, which we appreciate very much. Self hosted show slash S R E. I'd love to hear your ideas for challenges we could do over the coming months as well. Obviously, we did Jellyfin in January. Uh, if it's alliterative, it stands a much better chance of being adopted. <laughs> so I'll just true. say that right now. <laughs> 100%. Luckily, there isn't a month beginning with P for Podman. So I don't have to switch away from Docker quite yet. But. Uh, Maybe someone will invent a new month or something, or, or there's a month beginning with P in a different language. Who knows? Uh, but until then, you can go to selfhosted.show slash contact for all the ways to get in touch with us. Brent, where can people find you these days? I think the Linux Unplugged podcast is a great place to go, linuxunplugged.com. Brentley, thank you for joining us. And of course, you can get more Brent, officehours.hair as well. I'm uh, going to plug the Jupiter Tube. Generally, it's working like it was this week, eventually. And we do the show live every other Wednesday over at jupiter.tube and jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time. It's working as long as we have a WESBot on hand. <laughs> right. Very handy when you have a WESBot that can kick things into gear. And thanks for listening, everybody. That was selfhosted.show slash 89.